Oh, oh dear, Blake. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm going to cry, which is not a good way to start a lecture, but uh, it's obviously very meaningful. I really appreciated your, your introduction, and it's what every teacher wants to hear, because um, in many ways, I really wrote this book for my students. It's the product of, of some 17 years of teaching American foreign policy to undergraduates and struggling to understand foreign policy as it actually is rather than the way that it's talked about and wanting that to communicate that to students and I hope to give you a sense of that here today. But to just to get you warmed up, I wanted to start with a rhetorical question. Tell me, can you hear me okay? All right. And that, that rhetorical question is this. Why do the firms who recently benefited from government handouts and loans continue to have so much power in the contemporary political system? Just stop and think about that. I'm, and what's fascinating about this question, I, I, I gave this uh, a version of this talk at Goldman Sachs on Monday. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Their answer is a whole lot different from the other places where I speak. Um, they have a very different answer. But I think there's all, you know, you can see lingering in the air in many of the places that I speak, this idea that there's some kind of conspiracy of Wall Street against Main Street. Uh, others point to the revolving door between the private sector and government, which allows market values to reign supreme in Washington. What most Americans do not realize, however, is that one big reason that money has captured our politics is because our government today, our federal government today, is but a shadow of its former self. Just to give you one statistic that I think is stunning, the size of the executive branch federal workforce in 2008 was exactly the same size as it was in 1963. Yet in that same time period, the federal budget in real terms more than tripled. Now that enormous gap is at least in part filled by contractors. That we have become one nation under contract means that there really is no longer any vigorous and disinterested government to turn to. After decades of quiet privatization, the US federal government is really today but a shadow of its former self, and this is not a partisan issue. Democrats and Republicans alike embraced outsourcing the work of government to the private sector, both for the same reasons that business do, businesses do. It's a means of cutting costs, or it's seen to be as a, mean, a means of cutting costs. It's a way of pursuing that elusive goal of greater efficiency. Well, my book focuses on a smaller slice of this much larger puzzle. It tells the story of how contractors came to dominate our foreign policy across the so-called three Ds of diplomacy, defense, and development. And it argues that the core, this is really the nutshell argument of the book, the core business of foreign policy has changed. But our strategies and frameworks for thinking about foreign policy have lagged behind. The result is that outsourcing as presently practiced is scandalous, but turning the clock back and reasserting top-down government control is no solution, tempting though it may be. It's no solution because outsourcing done right can fuel both innovation and efficiency, expanding opportunities for individuals to make a difference. So I argue that we don't need insourcing. We don't need to just bring whatever we can back into government, because that might create more problems than it solves. What we need instead is what I call smart sourcing. And I'm going to say a little bit about what I mean by that. From a, from a foreign policy perspective, turning the clock back, I'm just going to move this microphone so I don't ding it. Uh, turning the clock back from a foreign policy perspective is no solution either because the threats of the 21st century differ so radically from those of the Cold War years. So what's, what is needed is a whole scale reinvention of what we mean by foreign policy. I like to say that we don't need a new prescription for our glasses. We need a new eye chart. We need to look at different things to get, get foreign policy right. When we talk about the outsourcing of American power, that immediately takes us to Iraq and Afghanistan, which are our first two contractors' wars. According to the Congressional Research Service, contractors in 2009 accounted for 
of the Department of Defense workforce in Iraq and 57% in Afghanistan. Now, just to give you a sense of contrast, at the height of the Vietnam War, we had the highest troop levels in Vietnam. Our contract presence on the ground was just 13% of the total American presence. And keep in mind, the Pentagon is not the only government agency hiring contractors. The State Department and USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, make extensive use of contractors as well. So we have a situation today in both Iraq and Afghanistan in which contractors outnumber American men and women in uniform in those two countries, which is an interesting fact to note on Veterans Day. What does this mean? Well, it means that we think, and people in Washington currently think of contracting as a tactical issue, but it's really become a strategic one. Uh, consider this if I haven't convinced you already. These are some stunning numbers that aren't in the book that I just ran, and um, uh, the New York Times uh, editorial page is currently considering, considering them for publication. They'll be published somewhere, but you'll hear them here first today. If we look at uh, uh, the State Department, budget, say, and we say, how much went out the door in contracts and grants? How much of the State Department's requested budget went out the door in contracts and grants in 2008? That figure, ladies and gentlemen, is 82 uh, percent. Excuse me, 83 percent. 82 percent is the figure for the Department of Defense in 2008. 82 percent of DOD's uh, budget went out the door in contracts and grants, mostly contracts in 2008. You can look at USAID and the figure is even more stunning, 96 percent. We can talk about those figures later if you're, if you're interested. But what these numbers mean is that the core business of both the Pentagon and the State Department has changed. Now, there are both positive and negative aspects to this outsourcing of American power, and I want to really emphasize the positive, because we all know about the tales of corruption, abuse, waste, and fraud. I'm sure you follow that. The, the front headline in the paper yesterday was this latest news about Blackwater. Um, but there are positive aspects to this outsourcing we need to keep in mind. That is, just as globalization makes government outsourcing more attractive, it also expands the possibilities for independent action that makes a foreign policy difference. It's a, no exaggeration to say that it's possible for individuals today to make their own foreign policy when government falls short or lacks interest. And there are a number of examples of this. I don't, probably don't need to convince you of this, because we're in Little Rock, Arkansas, and you're probably familiar with something called the Clinton Global Initiative. People are familiar with that. I mean, look at the extraordinary foreign policy impact that initiative is having, and I hope will continue to have. But there's a couple of other examples you may not be as familiar with that I wanted to throw out there just to give you a little flavor of this positive aspect of the privatization of American power. One is Sam Nunn's Nuclear Threat Initiative. Do you know, are you familiar with the Nuclear Threat Initiative? This is really interesting. Um, what the Nuclear Threat Initiative does, it's an NGO that successfully intervened abroad to fill a vacuum that the U.S. government would typically have covered. So you have this problem in Belgrade at the Vinca nuclear reactor. They needed to get 100 pounds of potent nuclear materials flown to Russia for blending down. There were a whole range of bureaucratic obstacles to channeling U.S. government funds for this cleanup effort. So what did NTI do? NTI stepped in to fill the gap and gave the $5 million to make sure that that happened. And they did similar uh, efforts to fight proliferation in Kazakhstan. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but the Nuclear Threat Initiative has a new, a new uh, program, which is an effort to secure a nuclear fuel bank under international supervision. Now, you probably missed this, but a couple years back, Warren Buffett, you're familiar with Warren Buffett? Where does Warren Buffett, he comes from Omaha, right? Okay, Warren Buffett said, I will give you you, Bush administration, $25 million if you pony up the same amount of money, because we need to raise $100 million for this, this uh, nuclear fuel bank. Well, guess what? President Bush did it. The White House offered $25 million. Warren Buffett put down $25 million. They've since raised the other $100 million. So that's an example of the impact, the foreign policy impact that one individual can even have in today's world. And there are a number of other examples. Are you familiar with micro? Finance. You know, anybody heard of a, a 
organization called Kiva, which just got some bad press in the New York Times, but I'm still convinced they're doing the right thing. They're really trying to match aspiring entrepreneurs in the developing world with people who want to fund their projects. And this is done by the internet via PayPal. In May 2007, Kiva added the first Iraqi entrepreneurs to its website with this disclaimer. It read, this entrepreneur is from a volatile region where the security situation remains unsettled. Lenders to this business should be aware that this loan may represent a higher risk and accept this additional risk in making their loan. Well, despite the warning, all the loans were fully funded within a few hours, largely by American citizens who apparently wanted to lend a personal hand to the Iraqi reconstruction effort. And there are many, many other examples of this positive aspect of privatized power. You've, you've probably heard of the Grameen Bank. There's NGOs like Mothers to Mothers, which works for, uh, for HIV prevention in Africa. Uh, they do fabulous things. Uh, the majority of their budget comes from the US government. So it's interesting to consider that all these initiatives have the virtue of a smaller US footprint, which may be a positive thing in and of itself even though American philanthropy and sometimes your tax dollars are actually funding the work. Okay, that brings me to the negative aspects of the, private, of the outsourcing of American power. And the biggest is what I call laissez-faire outsourcing. What's laissez-faire outsourcing? Well, laissez-faire outsourcing is when government outsources oversight as well as implementation of a given project. And the most glaring example of laissez-faire outsourcing was the Coast Guard's deep water program. Anybody followed the deep water scandal? See, it's good. You've been spared knowing about the deep water scandal. I'm not going to spare you. You get to hear about it now. <laughs> it, was, it was a project launched in 2002, and it was a 25-year plan, the most comprehensive in the Coast Guard's history, to modernize and update the Coast Guard's fleet of boats and aircraft. And the Coast Guard did something unprecedented with this program. They delegated overall management of the project to a contractor. All right, so Integrated Coast Guard Systems, or ICGS, which was a joint venture of Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, ICGS was assigned the task of choosing who should perform the work, as well as the task of evaluating how well that work was performed. Well, not surprisingly, ICGS chose, who do you think they chose to do the work? Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman do the lion's share of the work. And the results were catastrophic. Four years into the program, the Coast Guard had fewer operational boats and ships than it had when Deepwater was first launched. And what had originally been a $17 billion project ballooned almost overnight into a $24 billion one with no end in sight. Things got so bad that I really, that I saw something wholly unprecedented, a Lockheed uh, Martin project manager by the name of Michael DeCourt thought that corruption was so rife that his only recourse was to post a whistleblower video on YouTube. You can go and see that if you want to type in Michael DeCourt YouTube, you'll see his whistleblower videos on the Deepwater Project. Well, this obviously, this laissez-faire outsourcing always, obviously has a range of negative consequences, and I want to talk about three three negative consequences of let's say fair outsourcing. The first is really an accountability and oversight problem of, or crisis of unprecedented proportions. The seriousness of the accountability challenge is reflected in disturbing war stories from Iraq. There were over 300 reported cases of contracting mistakes or abuses in Iraq from 2003 to 2007. There has not been a single instance to date of anyone being fired or denied promotion in connection with those cases. The Pentagon has publicly acknowledged that $8.2 billion, $8.2 billion of taxpayer money flowed through contracts into Iraq, some in stacks or pallets of cash without appropriate record keeping or oversight. For example, $68.2 million went to the United Kingdom, $45.3 million to Poland, and $21.3 million to Korea. Yet Pentagon auditors were unable to determine why the payments were made. Second negative consequence of this laissez-faire outsourcing is 
in all sorts of ways what I would call an overly ambitious international agenda. I think it's really the case that the use of contractors facilitate overextension, they facilitate fiscal irresponsibility, and more to the point, they facilitate war. If we send more troops to, to Afghanistan, who do you think is going to go with them? We're sending more contractors to, to Afghanistan with all these problems un, unaddressed. You might say that if we wanted to fight these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan without contractors, we would need a draft to do so. And when you have a draft, you have a very different situation than when you can simply throw money at a problem. And that disturbs me. But what disturbs me the most is I think these practices have le left us with a lost sense of government purpose, of those things that only government can do well. And this has a highly demoralizing imp impact on the American people and also on those who work in government, who see the real action flowing out the door. This expediency also makes it easy to contract out things that we shouldn't. In turn, our addiction to outsourcing has facilitated what I would call the militarization of American foreign policy. And it's interesting, this sounds like this radical term, militarization of American foreign policy, it sounds like some lefty making this argument. But, uh, you know, Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton have used, used the term. What it means is simply the rise of the Pentagon under both the Clinton and the Bush administrations as the go-to institution for getting things done overseas. It has the biggest budget, and since many of the things the Pentagon is asked to do uh, were beyond its standard purview, DOD became contracting central. You just hire someone to do it instead. Well, I'm the biggest admirer of, of uh, the Pentagon. When, uh, you know, they were the most helpful to me in my book, believe it or not. They answered all my questions and were completely transparent. I walked into that building, I would feel hugely patriotic. But just because DOD faithfully executes government wishes, I think that's admirable, doesn't mean uh, that this is the right thing to do. In other words, just because the Pentagon is able to do something doesn't mean that it should be doing it. And I would argue that promoting American values through the US military, which is a massive symbol of coercion rather than choice, usually undercuts the very values we seek to promote. So what do we do? And I was really passionate about this in my book. You'll see, and you might think some of the suggestions are wacky, but I felt it was my obligation to try to suggest some solutions to this problem. There are too many books written that chronicle all the things that are wrong with the United States, and too few that try to do something about it. And that's, that's why I wrote the final chapter, which is called A Post-Industrial Foreign Policy. That's what I, what I want us to embrace. Well, what do I mean by that? I have 10 suggestions for reform in the, the conclusion, but I want to highlight three the three most important here today. The first is we need to demilitarize American foreign policy. Uh, this is the first plank of what I'd call a post-industrial foreign policy. And all I mean by that is reallocate resources to civilian agencies and have civilians doing work that civilians should be doing. If you look at defense budgets uh, over time, anybody looked at defense budgets since the time of the founding of the Republic, you'll see they're nothing until 1945. And in 1945, they explode for understandable reasons and then they never really come down. Under Clinton, under President Clinton, God bless him, who balanced the budget, they did come down. That was the so-called peace dividend, but they'd never come down to their pre-1945 levels. And that's something to consider as, as well. We want to keep the country safe, uh, but nation building at home is also important. Second, we need smart sourcing, not insourcing. Uh, I think there are two aspects to this I'd want to highlight. First, we need to acknowledge the centrality of contracting in our foreign policy, realize that it's a strategic issue, and recruit, train, and retain a workforce of 21st century network managers, the ultimate public servants. Perhaps the Clinton School can train them. And, and these public servants will ensure quality work at all stages of a given project, rather than waiting for the Inspector General to tell us all these ter terrible tales after it's too late to do something about it. But second, and uh, I think smart sourcing requires banning the use of armed contractors in war zones, in war zones, especially the State Department using armed contractors. Uh, they are agents of overreaching. But I think more importantly, our current dependence on weapon-wielding private actors has blurred the line between the legitimate and the illegitimate use of force. And you know what? That's just what terrorists want. 
They want to blur the line between the legitimate and Ill illegitimate use of force. So why are we handing this to them on a platter? Why are we doing things that we wouldn't really want to see other people doing? So I'd really reconsider that practice. Third plank of this post-industrial foreign policy, if you will, involves embracing what I would call radical transparency. In theory, the information age has made transparency easy. Simply posting all the relevant contracts and a clear record of how funds were expended on a publicly uh, accessible website advances the cause. And indeed, this is just what USAspending.gov does if you've looked at it. You can track where your taxpayer dollars go. If you want to track how the stimulus money is being spent, there's a website for that. Fantastic. You can look up contracts. It's all contracts. No website for the TARP. You won't find any transparency there. And you won't find any information on subcontracts and subgrants, even though it's been mandated by law to be made publicly available in, by January 2009. You'll just find a, a, a sign on the website that says, under reconstruction. So we needed to demand that that, that takes place. But I think the Obama administration understands this. Uh, President Obama issued a March 4, 2009 memorandum ordering a government-wide review of our contracting practices. So, so change is potentially at hand, but I think it's important to keep in mind that sunlight always challenges the powers that be. It always challenges the status quo. So it will be a long struggle. Uh, but I think if any administration can get it right, it's this one. But I want to end on a positive note. I think the positive aspects of the privatization of American power also give us cause for hope. That is, when we look at foreign policy today as it really is, we see that there are plenty of things that you and I can do, even when our government falls short, strategies that can be pursued by the general public over the heads of both business and government that exploit the power of the Internet. I think Larry Ellison was right. The Internet changes everything. I'll give you an example. Have you heard of something called WikiLeaks? Okay, this is cool. You've heard of it. Good. The WikiLeaks initiative demonstrates the unprecedented power that the web potentially places in the hands of ordinary citizens. And keep in mind, I wrote this book with all publicly available information. Okay, you can do it too. Um, WikiLeaks is developing a searchable Wikipedia for untraceable document leaking and analysis. That is, whistleblowers around the globe can anonymously post evidence of corruption or dishonesty on the internet in any language. And the relevant user community can then collaborate on providing the context for interpretation. And WikiLeaks beta site stated its core principles, and I want to read you their core principles because I think they're so important. Here they are. We believe that it is not only the people of one country that keep the government honest, but also the people of other countries who are watching that government. We propose that every authoritarian government, every oppressive institution, and even every corrupt corporation be subject to the pressure, not merely, of international diplomacy or freedom of information laws, not even of quadrennial elections, but of something far stronger, the individual consciences of the people within them. So in conclusion, the outsourcing of American power ultimately means we need a brand new template for thinking about how government and the private sector should interact in the information age. But the key players, however, are not just Wall Street and Washington, but each and every one of us. I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention, and love to hear your questions. Thank you. If you do raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so we can, can all hear, Frank? Bill? Yeah, right here. Wonderful presentation, Professor. Thank you. Uh, so much of what you said reminds me of uh, the last time Dwight Eisenhower made a public uh, speech when he left, when he left the uh, White House. He said, beware of the military-industrial complex. Do you find that consistent with your views? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and go back and read that speech. It almost predicts what's happened, except that now we have what I, Tom Freeman co coined this phrase. He has this knack for taking an argument and making it better by coming up with the perfect phrase. He called it the contractor industrial complex. And I think that's even more accurate. But yeah, everything Eisenhower warned about uh, is relevant and salient to today. <laughs>
he really foresaw what it meant to have these enormous defense budgets in peacetime. And one big consequence is you still have it, even though it's not peacetime anymore, but we sort of pretend it's peacetime, even though we're fighting two wars. Good point. Go, if, if I, st I have this tendency, I'm going to tell you right now, Blake knows this, I like to wander all around. Now, it's just one problem. I wore this outfit today that does not have a pocket. So I cannot, I mean, I can, I can walk around like this, but I'm afraid it's going to give all kinds of distortion and yucky sounds. So, so just wave your hand if you don't hear me, and then I'll amend Bye. my ways. Hello, uh, my name Hi. is Ryan. I'm a Clinton School student. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, as I've graduated from high school and college where I was somewhat uh, ambivalent to all the world problems, I mean, I worked at Disney World and it was all <laughs> kumbaya, you know, ask my classmates that I'm a big old love and dovey kind of person. And uh, as I hear these, the, your, both your comments and several other speakers, yeah. I've been exposed to the reality that there are people in the world who are kind of corrupt, number one, but w are willing to do basically anything for power and money. And so uh, my question for you, being a conspiracy theorist, is as you've investigated some of these things, have you had any personal pressure placed on you to not write this book or not expose these things given the, um, the things that people will do for, to keep these under wraps and control? And how do you deal with that? That's a, that's a, that's a really great point. Um, so far, no, but sometimes when I stand up talking, I, I do get a little bit worried because I watch these stupid movies like, what was that movie with um, Russell Crowe and, and uh, what was it called? Yeah, State of Play. You know, the private contracts were tracking the people who were investigating and it was, you know, they were almost getting murdered at every turn. Don't watch that movie, it's scary. <laughs> but you put your finger on a much larger problem, which is that we have become a nation of consumers. We need to become a nation of citizens. And I think ordinary people have remained citizens. It's the elites that are the problem. But let's keep them honest. You know, the great thing about, about elites is that um, they want to be loved. They want to be revered. And that was the interesting thing to me about speaking at Goldman Sachs, is that was what really bugged them. You know, people... What do, you, what do you mean you're not impressed with me? I'm a master of the universe, you know? But I think we've got, what we've got to do is, and this is why it's really funny, because I came, came out of uh, Goldman Sachs thinking there's one, you know, somebody's got to tell firms like Goldman Sachs that they've got to become part of the solution as soon as possible, or they're not going to make any money because the whole system will come crashing down. It almost did. And who's going to deliver that message? You should talk to Bill Clinton when he's here next week. I think he'd be a perfect person to deliver that message to the wealthiest uh, companies and banks in this country. Use, maybe using the Clinton Global Initiative as a model. Why aren't they, why, why are they keeping all this money? Why aren't they becoming part of the solution? So that's, that's my mission. They have to be citizens too, would be another way of making the same point. Question of the yeah. uh, professor. Yeah. Oh, uh, there you are. Hi. Sorry, <laughs> I'm kind of hidden over here. Uh, I'm John Brennerman. I'm a doctor, um, but also a colonel in the uh, uh, National Guard. Uh, got back from Iraq last summer. Thank you and, for your service. Uh, uh, something occurred to me while I was there, and uh, watching this sea of contractors uh, around me, and so I posed a question to myself and I came up with my own answer, which I won't share, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Looking at all this sea of non-military people doing stuff that in my dad's era would have been done by people in uniform, I asked myself, does this maybe make it a little easier to go to war? You've put your finger on exactly what's distasteful about this practice is that it turns war into a money-making operation. War should not be about making money. War should be about, you know, service and defending freedom. Uh, and, you know, I don't have to tell you some of the negative consequences on our American men and women in uniform of seeing people, you know, in polo short, shirts um, doing roughly the same thing for three times the pay. What are we communicating to our soldiers? It's not something 
I think, that expresses American values. And, and no one's really talking about this, but it is absolutely true that um, our use of contractors makes it a lot easier to go to war. And going to war should not be easy. And going to war should be something that, that uh, has a national commitment behind it on the part of the citizens, not just on the part of elites. So I would thank you for your service. We value it enormously, and um, it's, it's for all the right reasons. So you should feel good about yourself and sleep well at night. <laughs> Hi, thank you for speaking. Uh, my name is Nicholas Hall. I'm a student at the Clinton School. When I hear you speak about outsourcing, it makes me think of my friend who was a Marine and part of the invasion force yeah. in Iraq. And as soon as he got off the plane back and became a civilian again, his living room and his phone became a recruiting source for these armed contractors. And I would kind of hope you would speak to how this is almost an exploitation of the lower classes of our society as these 22-year-olds with post-traumatic stress disorder get off the plane and all of a sudden money is just thrown at them to go back into that situation. You mean as, as, as to be redeployed or as contractors? Yeah, I mean that... There are many disturbing elements to a story like that. Um, it's, it's even hard to know where to begin. I think that we have devalued the notion of service. Uh, and we have turned money into the supreme value. And we did that, you know, I don't mean to be pointing fingers at certain people. Um, we all kind of embrace market values. We all sort of had this faith that markets to, to deliver all these things that we never should have expected markets to, de to deliver. Uh, so in a sense, we've got to rediscover those things that only government can do well. And one of them, I think, is, is um, upholding the security of the country. So yeah, I am deeply disturbed by uh, war fighting being something that's predominantly done by some people who may not have other options. And I'm disturbed by not seeing members of our elites at our, you know, our best universities not considering military service as something that is desirable. That's a strange split. It didn't used to be that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. And I'd like to see that change. Um, so yeah, that, your story disturbs me. Right here. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think you have blurred uh, uh, two different kinds of things. Uh, NGOs like Kiva, mm -hmm. which are not government contracted, uh, at least as I understand Kiva and my yep. uh, involvement with it, uh, and the, the uh, obviously Blackwater and that to, to take the other mm -hmm. extreme. But uh, yeah, uh, so that. We need to encourage one and discourage the other, but uh, discussing them all together, they're, they're all uh, maybe foreign policy, but contracted uh, groups like Blackwater and non-contracted groups like Kiva are, are very different and need to be, I think, kept more separate. That's a, that's a really good point, and let me try to make the counter-argument as to why I'm lumping them together. I, I make the distinctions in the book, and you're right. There's a difference between doing something for profit and doing it not for profit, no, no question. But the reason I lump them together is because I think the nature of power has changed. And that's what I'm trying to capture by talking about the outsourcing or privatization of American power, that the power of the individual or the organization vis-a-vis -vis the state is greater than it's ever been. So yes, you're right. Uh, if you wanted to take a first cut that the for-profit entities are probably doing more good in the world than the, than the pro excuse the not-for-profit entities are probably doing more good in the world than the for-profit entities, but then you've got to step back. You, you really should read my book because what I show is how that line between for-profit and not-for-profit is really blurred. This NGO that I talked about, Mothers to Mothers, is run by former investment bankers. They use best business practices. 
And when you look at, you know, how you really want to help people in the developing world, um, I'm a big uh, advocate of giving people choices uh, and letting them see what they can do, regardless of race, you know, religion, ethnicity, any kind of distinction you would want to make to try to say that one group of people is better than another. And that's what capitalism does. Uh, it eliminates all kinds of prejudice and barriers, primarily because it elevates making money as its supreme value. It says, you know, okay, you go out there and if you can make money, we don't care what you look like or where you come from. Congratulations. And there's something positive to that because a lot of our freedoms, I think it particularly the, the um, empowerment of women is intimately connected to, you know, free markets. So I'm really careful not to beat up too much on the profit motive. I want to harness the profit motive for positive purposes. And it's a delicate balancing act, but I think it can be done. So, but you'll have to read the book and tell me if I, if, if I succeeded or failed. Because it's a good point you're making. Right there. When I heard you talk about the uh, size of the federal government and then the size of the budget, I yeah. thought, what happened to Parkinson's law? Is this a way of uh, going around Parkinson's law and still doing the same thing, letting what? the contractors? W w refresh Park my memory. What's Parkinson's, Parkinson's law? Parkinson says work will expand to fill the time available <laughs> and that the workforce will expand to... to uh, uh, oh, fill the time okay. available yep. also. We've kept the same workforce. We've tripled the budget. Is this a way of uh, going around Parkinson and yet doing the same thing? Just letting our... Very, very smart point. It is. Because what we have is, in a sense, the old divisions between left and right no longer are as salient as they used to be. Because today we can have big government that's big in terms of spending, but small in terms of employees. That, that didn't used to be the case. And you're really right that this whole impulse to outsource is very much wrapped up in all sorts of legislation that mandates keeping employee levels, you know, capping them. And so if you cap employee levels, but you, you, know, you still have the budget, what are you going to spend it on? You can get around those caps by contracting out. And that's precisely what happened to USAID. That's why it's literally become a contracting agency, because all sorts of caps are placed on the number of people it could have in-house. Overseeing, overseeing the work, um, and it's still got budgetary money for foreign aid. So how did it spend it? On outsourcing. But there's this illusion there that somehow we've got small government. We don't have small government, not with the kind of spending levels we have today. And that's another thing that fo a focus on contractors will really draw your attention to. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the draft. Do you have any opinion about that, going back to a draft for the military? Yeah. Um, you know, if we're going to fight wars, I would like to, to see everybody, be in, you know, the entire American population be committed to the cause to the extent possible. We all know the political costs <laughs> that are associated with any politician instituting the draft. If you remember the Vietnam War, all those protests on college campuses, you can almost graph them to the draft and the ending of the draft. Everything died down when people were no longer to put, put their lives on the line. But you know what I'm really interested in? And this is, again, a good place to make this statement, the Clinton School of Public Service. I'd like to see a, a national service requirement, which you could, you could um, fulfill through the military or through civilian work. I think that'd be really good for the country. You had one back there? Well, thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, you. I'm just curious of your thoughts on, uh, you know, how this might also carry over into domestic policy. I'm thinking of, you know, things like farming, you know, outsourcing bridge construction and toll roads and all that. And really, yeah. is there a difference from your perspective, or is this just unique to, you know, government in general and some of the challenges that uh, that have, have, we've seen in foreign policy as well? Yeah, that's a really great question. I'm focused on foreign policy in my book, but I think this applies to government as a whole. So anybody, any uh, graduate students out there looking for good research projects, that my book really tees up a whole lot of other things to look at. Because I think that some of the challenges we're facing with both uh, the, fisc the, you know, the, the financial crisis, health care, uh, and these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are all interrelated. I mean, part of the, part of the reason that um, 
uh, health care reform is so difficult to pass is because there are these private interests that lobby very successfully to uh, change the way congressmen vote. And you can't, you can't really blame them because our whole system is set up so that to get re-election, you need these people to support you with money and it ties your hands in all sorts of ways. So I think one of the ways we can get at this problem at a whole is, is through uh, campaign finance reform to break that cycle. Uh, but but um, there's also a cycle that's caused by the fact that the business of government is really business now. Because if that's the case, you see this whole lobby to continue, continue getting those contracts and receiving the work. And in that sense, too, business has a predominant influence on government. So we need, need to reassert the primacy of government, not to sort of institute top-down bureaucracies. I hate bureaucracies because it's only government that can uphold the public interest. The private sector cannot be relied on to do that. And, and they shouldn't be relied on. They're supposed to make money. We want that dynamis, dynam, dynamism. But government has to reassert its proper role. We have time for just one more question. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, you brought up movies and articles from the New York Times. There was a movie, Mr. Charlie's War. I don't know if you remember it, about a Charlie representative. Charlie Wilson's War? You re a representative who got Congress to fund clandestinely uh, people fighting against communism. Mm -hmm. And he got more and more money until he finally asked for money for a school. And then they, they sort of balked. Now, I understand it cost, cost over $100,000 a year to keep a U.S. soldier deployed. Mm -hmm. There are initiatives that build schools with local involvement in Afghanistan, and so far they have not been attacked. I, I picked this up from a New York Times article. Mm -hmm. They have been, not been attacked by the Taliban. Uh, is there any way we could push to get some of this, all this government money we're spending for fighting a war to build more schools in Afghanistan? Yeah. I, think there's, I think there's a lot of things we can do, and we currently have a Secretary of State who is in the process of doing them. So just give it some time. You're speaking of three cups of tea. Did you read that book? One student uh, in, who's currently at the Clinton School picked that as their favorite book, I noticed. Uh, it's really important to see what one man could accomplish and ask yourself whether you know, private citizens can accomplish things that official US government assistance cannot. And I would submit that they can. Do you know why? Because I think all human beings are in some way alike. They want to own their own destiny. They don't want to shape for them. And so if you can give people a, a leg up so that they can shape their own future, they're going to own that future in a way that they won't own that future if you, you know, give them U.S. government money and say you must do X, Y, and Z. And oh, by the way, you owe it to us. You know, give us credit for helping you. I'm less interested in the U.S. government receiving credit. I'm more interested in getting results. Um, and I think we can move in that direction.